fundamental to understand. So the, I mean, I'll begin a little bit with the uh, geology and history of the marsh. As I said, for any presentation, it, it's just fundamental to understand it because one of the things I found was that when people came to Horicon and got that spectacular view of that vast marsh, uh, there was oftentimes this impression as if it had always been preserved. And what you'll find very quickly is this is a marsh that's gone through a lot of changes. And quite honestly, almost anything you can imagine doing the wetland happened at Horicon and it took place at a very large scale. So Horicon Marsh lies in East Central Wisconsin. It is 32,000 acres in size. The marsh measures 13 and a half miles long and between three and five miles wide. And it is the largest freshwater cattail marsh in the United States. So that particular type of wetland, it is certainly the largest. Of course, we know that Okefenokee and uh, Everglades are far larger, but that certainly is also the biggest wetland in the upper Midwest. Like so much of uh, our upper Midwest landscape, the marsh basin was formed during the last ice age. And it was more than just the ice just scraping it out. And I'll give you a little bit of a, uh, a larger uh, regional perspective of what happened. Now, this is the bedrock geology for Wisconsin. And what you're seeing is right along this area is the Niagara escarpment. So the eastern part of Wisconsin is Niagara limestone. And it comes to the surface right along that western edge of that bedrock. It actually dips very steeply to the east, goes under Lake Michigan, under Lake Huron Erie, where it makes a deeper bedrock layer and comes back up again 500 miles to the east to make Niagara Falls, thus its name. And so this large cliff, so to speak, the uh, edge of the Niagara Escarpment had a direct influence on the movement of the glaciers and of course the formation of the landscape after that. So as the ice was advancing out of the north, it ran into that escarpment, which I've got outlined in red here. And what it did was it split the glacier off the tip of that Door County Peninsula. Now, where Lake Michigan lies today was a large expanse of a soft bedrock called shale, a compact compressed mud and clay, easily eroded. And that's how Lake Michigan came into existence was that the glacier essentially scoured out all of that soft bedrock to create that vast lake. But to the west, the escarpment basically forced the ice inland. And in doing so, it split it around uh, Door County Peninsula and you had two parallel running ice masses, one coming down to form Lake Michigan, the other one further inland created three big basins across Eastern Wisconsin. First is the inlet of Lake Michigan, Green Bay, south of that, Lake Winnebago, and beyond that, the Horicon Marsh. And as the ice continued to advance, these two separate ice masses grew in size and then uh, not only spread to the south and to the west, but also surmounted that ledge and spread to the east and they ran into each other to create a very complex series of glacial features called the Kettle Moraine. So that whole northern Kettle Moraine area all the way down to our southern Kettle Moraine State Forest, that is all one interlobate moraine complex uh, formed where these two ice masses eventually joined. So you can see here that brown shows the moraine deposits at the outermost extent of the ice. You can see in central and western Wisconsin how the ice advance was held back, and that's because of the trough of Lake Superior. It was uh, quite an obstacle to sink that far down Lake Superior, climb back out of there, and crawl over the northern highlands of Wisconsin. So essentially the ice lost steam and didn't reach as far south to the west. So here we see Lake uh, Winnebago and south of that the Horicon Marsh as they were formed. And you can also see where the ice itself formed that outermost moraine. Now, what happened is the ice didn't just disappear overnight. It wasn't just a steady progression, just melting back to the north. It was a series of steps and stages. So here we see that outermost reach of the ice. And these are the brown is the de uh, moraine deposits. You'll notice that there are a series of parallel running uh, moraine deposits in here and then across this part of Wisconsin. And essentially, if you kind of connect the dots, you'll see that this was the maximum extent. It receded then to this area, then receded a little farther. And so it would pause and it finally reached up where this black line is. The ice stopped there for a while. 
And every time the ice came to rest, it formed a moraine, what we call a recessional moraine. In other words, during the receding of the ice. So we have that terminal moraine or end moraine is the maximum extent of the ice where it dumps all of that debris. And then it's receding if it pauses periodically, these uh, recessional moraines are formed. And you notice how those bands of moraine deposits are kind of broken. Well, it's just because it didn't rest long enough to form a complete uh, concentric ring around the, the outermost extent of the ice. Well, this is important for work on Mars because if you look, the ice advanced to gouge out the base of the marsh and then stopped right across the south end of the marsh. The uh, city of Horicon, city on the south end of the marsh, is on moraine deposit. And so essentially a big wall was formed of glacial deposit across the south end of the marsh. And as the ice now melted back from there toward Lake Winnebago, the meltwaters filled that basin to first begin not as a marsh, but as a vast post-glacial lake. So like Lake Winnebago, Horicon began as a large shallow lake at the end of the ice age. What held it back and of course what formed it was that moraine, which essentially was a very weakly built dam. It was just the debris of the glacier, the sand, gravel, rock, and clay, which was easily eroded over time. And so slowly that uh, moraine began to wear through, the Rock River was eroding it, and it eventually drained the lake, but not completely. And that gave birth then to a wetland. And that was essentially the geological origins of the Horicon Marsh. Of course, at the end of the Ice Age, uh, the wildlife assemblage included not only animals of today, but the uh, large Ice Age mammals, the mastodons and woolly mammoths, saber-toothed cats. They were all part of our landscape. And in fact, we have found uh, some of the remains of uh, woolly mammoth and even mastodon within the vicinity of Horicon Marsh, uh, say five, 10 miles away from the marsh, we found some of the remains. So we know these animals roamed there at that time. We also know that at the end of the ice age was a large invasion or immigration of uh, nomadic people coming across the Bering Land Bridge into North America. Whether they were the first people in North America uh, or whether this was a, a, a little bit later large immigration, I think that's still somewhat open to debate. There's more and more evidence of people possibly having lived here during or maybe even before the last ice age problem is that that evidence is so few and uh, so heavily worn, it's, it's difficult to fit into the, the human uh, history puzzle. But uh, we do know that there was this large immigration of people coming across the Bering Land Bridge and rapidly spreading throughout North America. These were the mammoth hunters and they were at Horicon uh, as well as throughout so much of the, the continent. They are very typified by a couple of the known spear points, especially the uh, Clovis tip. Um, and by the way, the Clovis tip got its name from the site where it was first identified, Clovis, New Mexico. And before carbon dating, this gave the clue that these people were hunting these large animals because the Clovis, New Mexico spear point was found embedded in the hip bone of a mastodon. So we know that before those animals disappeared, people were hunting them indeed. And then finding that evidence across the rest of North America linked essentially those nomadic hunters to that very early time period. Well, the Native Americans, never had a written language. So unlike, say, people who study the Mayans or the Egyptians, we can actually go back to the glyphs and texts and read something of the history they recorded. For Native Americans, the history is written in the uh, artifacts they left behind. And certainly some of the uh, most common artifacts are the uh, arrowhead spear points and other stone tools, something that just essentially just does not uh, disappear over time. <clears throat> so. This is actually just one single collection from a, a person I knew around the marsh, what he found on uh, a couple of farms on that southwest corner of the marsh. And I know uh, over a half a dozen people who've got collections at least equal to this. So obviously, a huge collections of artifacts indicate that there was also a huge human population. And for those who know something about these artifacts, you'll see there's a lot of different sizes, shapes, and styles of them. Those actually represent different cultural periods. And on top of that, these are not all uh, arrowheads, so to speak. In fact, most of them aren't even arrowheads for the true bow and arrow. Those are the little ones an inch in length. These are spear points. There's a knife blade down here. These are drill bits. So it's a number of different kinds of stone tools, both for hunting uh, as, as well as uh, other type of uh, work. So this kind of an archeological record 
tells us that every major prehistoric Indian culture known to the upper Midwest is represented in that archeological record of Horicon Marsh. Essentially, beginning with the mammoth hunters as nomads, right up until the time that the first Europeans arrived, there was probably continuous occupation of Horicon Marsh over a 12,000 year period. In other words, this was always the great hunting ground. And it was the rich resources of the marsh that drew the people there, and obviously in large numbers. Oh, by the way, as an aside, I'll mention this right now. Uh, I was in Madison today meeting with uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Kurt Sampson, who is an archaeologist, and we are working on the very last bit of a book we're doing on the uh, Indian mounds of uh, Dodge County and Horicon Marsh. And so it's something I've had in my mind for uh, many, many years. And so uh, right now, uh, we are hoping to get it to ready for publication. And uh, we have uh, been able to document more than 140 mound sites, which may consist of a single mound up to maybe over 100 mounds and totally more than a thousand mounds that were known just in that area, right around Horicon Marsh in that single county. So uh, uh, these are probably the most uh, unique of the artifacts that people left behind were the different uh, Indian mounds, both conical mounds, linear mounds, in other words, geometric shapes, and of course the uh, very unique uh, effigy mounds, the animal shaped mounds. <clears throat> so here we see that timeline from the bottom uh, 10,000 BC, so 12,000 years ago, early, late Paleo Indians, the Archaic period, and then all the way through that woodland period. And don't even ask what tribe those belonged to. This was before the tribes themselves actually became organized. It was essentially those people who developed agriculture, took on unique cultural identities, and they then became the tribes. When the Europeans arrived, they recorded that Horicon Marsh and the Rock River was the, the dividing boundary between the Winnebago Indians who, or Ho-Chunk Nation that lived on the west side of the marsh and the Potawatomis that lived on the east. In fact, just south of Horicon Marsh, there are historic records of Winnebago and Potawatomi villages right across the river from each other. That was the, the state boundary, so to speak, between those two tribes. Well, like so much of North America, for 12,000 years, Native Americans were drawn to the marsh. They took advantage of it and uh, <clears throat> lived by it. All the changes, of course, happened in that last 150 years. Here we see uh, one of the surveys of the effigy mounds. This was uh, our first state archaeologist, geologist, Increase Lapham. This is where the city of Horicon lies today. This is where the Rock River flows out of the marsh. And these are the effigy mounds that he mapped just in that area uh, this particular site was more than 90 mounds, and you notice some of the very unusual uh, effigy mound shapes here. Uh, very uniquely, of course, which I guess is understandable, the goose mounds that were found there, the long-tailed, what are called panther mounds, different animal shapes. This one probably looking like an otter, uh, so representing both real and even somewhat uh, mythical creatures, or this sort of a compound complex mound, which we have no idea what they intended for that. So there certainly was a much deeper meaning to all of it. But as I say, you have this occupation, you have this mark on the land, and uh, those were the effigy mounds on this map that were lo located right in this area that I'm showing with the cursor. 90 mounds right there, and they stretch down the river and around, uh, especially the east side of the mound on the high ground leading up to the escarpment. Uh, there were just hundreds and hundreds of uh, effigy mounds there. The site where uh, the city of Horicon lies, we're looking here in an early depiction of that, that was a later on a Winnebago Indian village site. So where the effigy mound builders were in prehistoric times, the Winnebago Indians or Ho-Chunk Nation established a large city, which was known as a, a village site known as Monk Shaka. And then the Europeans arrived, same site, sitting at the foot of this uh, incredible resource. The site was originally identified by an early fur trader and trapper by the name of Solomon Juno in Wisconsin. He's also known as the founder of Milwaukee. He did not settle here, but he just made notes of it as he traveled through the area that this would be a suitable area. That was 1839. The first settlement began in uh, 1845, and they built at the outlet of the marsh, right in this area, a small dam to power a sawmill. So 1845 was the first change with a small dam that was constructed there. The entire marsh changed the following year, 1846. The dam was enlarged using logs, rocks, mud, and hay built 150 feet across the river, nine feet high, 
And what made it possible is built within the glacial moraine. So they essentially just plugged up the outlet. And in 1846, they flooded the marsh nine feet above what you see today. In other words, they created what was called the largest man-made lake in the world for its time and a lake that it hadn't been since the end of the Ice Age. So Lake Horicon, as they refer to it, flooded that marsh nine feet above its uh, original stage. And on the east side where the land rises up abruptly to uh, the escarpment, it essentially just raised it up uh, along the, those uh, hills along the side. But to the west is a very flat landscape. And so here, those nine feet of uh, water added to it spread way out across the original border of the marsh and flooded the surrounding farmland. So this led to disputes because the farmers who had uh, bought or homesteaded that land and hoping to make a living off of it found now that they were not owning farmland, but lake bottom. So they took their, took their case to the courts. And in 1869, it made its way all the way to the Wisconsin State Supreme Court and the court ruled in the favor of the landowners. They prompted the dam operators to uh, give them one of two choices. <clears throat> they either had to pay the landowners compensation for the loss of crops every year that that lake was in existence, or they needed to remove the dam, which was what they did. So Lake Horicon was somewhat short-lived, 1846 till 1869. And with that, they slowly disassembled the dam, let the water down, and that was the end of the first era. So that now set the stage for the next uh, chapter in Horicon's history. Here we're seeing one of the uh, only known photos of Lake Horicon from that period, and uh, also an early postcard, which uh, was drawn on, sort of looks like the early day Photoshop. Uh, they had five steamboats that were operating on Lake Horicon to both take lumber across the lake to the railroad at the city of Horicon, and also for tourism. Very early tourism uh, operations took place at that time. Uh, here's a picture of the, uh, this is not the true removal of the dam in 1869. This is actually a, a photo from 1925. They were rebuilding the bridge across the, uh, the river. And what they found is as they were working to uh, establish the new footings, and foundation for the bridge, the old logs were still there. They were preserved in the bottom of the river from that era. So we're looking at a period of um, uh, almost 50 years later, the logs were still uh, there in the bottom of the river. And so they dredged some of that out and built a new bridge. So now that dam was removed, the lake disappeared, and here came Horicon Marsh. And here's an early photo of the marsh in its condition at that time, 1900. And so 1869, to the early 1900s, this was uh, all vast wetland. And the earliest records we have of what the wetland environment was like and the assemblage of wildlife that was present. And of course, the mindset of the day was that, and it wasn't, I should say, it was not so much a goose marsh as people may think of it today, but a duck marsh. It was one of the great uh, waterfowl resources of the upper Midwest. And it was viewed as if it was an unlimited resource. And with no sense of conservation, no hunting laws or regulations or seasons whatsoever, two major hunting operations established themselves in the late 1800s. First of those was private hunting clubs. And there were five major hunting clubs that were established around the Horicon Marsh. And uh, they basically were divided by what the locals called the, uh, the local clubs and the out-of-towners clubs. And so we're seeing on the left-hand side, this is a, a shot of uh, the guys for a day of hunt. This was one of the local clubs. And uh, local clubs, what it basically was, was uh, your friends and your relatives got together and uh, created these clubs and had somewhat exclusive membership. Uh, the first club that was established there was called the Caw Caw Club. Uh, it was soon found, followed by the Horicon Shooting Club, the Strux Club, the Diana Club, and the last to come was the Greenhead Club. And by the way, the Greenhead Club is still operating today. And uh, the Greenhead Club, according to their charter, they only allow, well, it was originally uh, 16 members, then they raised it to 19, I think it's 22 now that they allow. In other words, it's still kind of an exclusive club. And if you wanna become a member of the Greenhead Club, I've always told people this, you better start hanging around with one of the people there, spend a little time with them, go out duck hunting, get to know them well, let them know you're interested, and then you better wait for one of those members to die or retire to open up a slot for you. That's the only way you're getting in. 
Now, the out-of-towners club, they were also exclusive, but it wasn't so much limited just by membership. It was because the fees were set so high. These were the wealthiest businessmen from uh, the Horicon area, from throughout Wisconsin, Chicago, and also some of their uh, partners coming all the way from out east. The largest of those clubs was the Diana Shooting Club, which took its name from the Greek goddess of hunting. The Diana Hunting Club was such an exclusive club, they had their own railroad stop. The train that went from Chicago to St. Paul came along the west side of the marsh and had its own stop. So they would ride the train up, stop right there on the west side of the marsh. The uh, horse and buggy was there to meet them, take them to the clubhouse, wine and dine them. They'd go out and shoot a bunch of ducks for the day and uh, jump back on the rails and head back again. So while there uh, certainly were no hunting limits for it, these people uh, set their own limits and they did not allow uh, any spring hunting. So they knew that the ducks needed a chance to, to nest. They actually established their first conservation uh, uh, regulations on the marsh, which were privately uh, organized. And also they limited the bag limit to only 25 ducks a day. Now, compared to what we have today, uh, that sounds extremely liberal, but 25 ducks a day was at least a limit because you see the other hunting that took place was not just sport hunting or hunting clubs. It was market hunting. Uh, here, by the way, this is the uh, uh, membership for the Diana Shooting Club. This is from an original membership, the uh, Wilt, uh, president, Wilton Van Buren. Uh, he was president and founder of the club. And this is for uh, C.W. Hart then, who became a member. But the other operation that took place at Horicon was market hunting. And for those not familiar with market hunting, uh, let's say that you went to Milwaukee, Chicago, or any of the big cities, and you're looking for food. It wasn't just grocery stores, but you also had people selling wild game. At that time, you could literally buy things as not just your beef, pork, and chicken, but they had available when it was in season. Venison, so deer was for sale. So were duck, goose, crane, passenger pigeon. All of those were fair game. And the way they hunted the ducks is not like today. You don't just put out a few decoys, call a duck or two over and shoot whatever you can as it flies by. Uh, what they did is they didn't want just a bird or two out of the flock. They wanted the whole flock. And what you're seeing here, this is an, uh, an actually a photo of the punt gun that was, this was, was used on Chesapeake Bay, but this was also the gun of choice at Horicon. The punt gun was a shotgun. But these were either two or four gauge shotguns. In other words, they were small cannons. They loaded these things with fine bird shot. Uh, they said sometimes if they still had gunpowder and ran out of lead shot, that they would use bits of nail chain, whatever they could. And they didn't just shoot at the birds, they baited them. So they would get out there early in the migration and spread uh, uh, some sort of a bait, usually shelled corn in the marsh or sometimes wheat and set up a big bait pile in the shallow water. In other words, like a big bird feeder. Lure all the birds in and all that bird activity, they acted like decoys to bring in even more and more birds. And when the water was literally blackened with hundreds, hundreds of birds, the hunters here would wait off the side of these uh, punt guns. And in a single shot, they said flames came out for 20 to 30 feet and it could easily drop 50 to 100 ducks at a time. This is a picture from the Lake Winnebago area, the Fox River, showing one day of hunting of market hunters. And uh, so they were basically driven by economics. The more birds you could shoot, the more you could sell, and the more money you could make. And with the assumption of the time that wildlife was an unlimited resource, they figured they could shoot all they want, there always would be more. And of course, I think we all know now in hindsight that this is where our conservation ethic grew out of was over hunting of waterfowl, the extinction of the pasture pigeon, the near loss of bison, and uh, the Audubon Society, of course, taking its uh, logo from the egrets that were being shot, that uh, wanton waste of wildlife uh, really underscored the need for some sort of self-restraint. And of course, I think the, the one thing that really drove this was the loss of the pasture pigeon. And as I've told people is, the pasture pigeon was probably one of the most abundant birds who ever lived in North America. And if you could wipe out the passenger pigeon, I think people woke up to realize nothing else stood a chance unless we were showed some sort of restraint. And in fact, in some people's minds, the early uh, uh, concept of conservation was not what we think of today of this long-term conservation of a new re a renewable resource perpetuating it into the future. The original idea was, well, this stuff isn't gonna last anyways, but let's at least uh, show some restraint to make it last a little longer. 
finally, with uh, good science, we finally realized that uh, if we were to take no more than what was uh, hatched every year, we could have a sustainable harvest. Well, this was still not the worst for Horicon Marsh because while they had so overshot the ducks, I think we realized that if you could protect the marsh and restrain the hunting, that the last few birds could come back, they could nest, they could rebuild their populations. And like we've seen with several other species recovery programs, if we could give it enough time, we could rebuild those populations to what we had originally. And while this market hunting certainly was devastating, it was not the worst for the marsh that was yet to come. Because see, Horicon Marsh today, we think of it as a natural resources with a lot of different amenities and benefits. Certainly it's important for wildlife, it's important for game birds and sport hunting, for canoeing, recreation, for a variety of outdoor activities, for bird watching, for non-game birds, for endangered species. It's also a big recharge area for local groundwater. It cleanses the surface water, all of the different things that we think of as benefits for wetlands. Back then, Horicon Marsh, whether it was market hunters, hunters or it was the uh, hunting clubs, it had only one single meaning. It was a duck marsh, plain and simple. And so it comes down to the point that by the early 1900s, when all the ducks are gone, what is the value of a duck marsh if it doesn't have any more ducks? So the local people oftentimes referred to this as the wasteland, as a useless piece of land. Here's another picture of the uh, market hunting. This is right off of Horicon Marsh. This is one single day of hunting and Horicon noticed mostly mallards that were taken. Well, people wanted to find another economic benefit from Horicon Marsh. And at the time, agricultural drainage was the big thing. And so uh, it was actual uh, investors from Illinois back, who were the backers, financial backers for developers of, who came to this area, who uh, basically sold the farmers on the idea of dredging the marsh and farming it. And so in 1910, they brought this large dredge up. And by the way, the American Steel Dredge Company was the same one that built the dredge for, that, for draining the Everglades. It was assembled in a uh, Chicago area and brought by rail by bits and pieces up to Wapun, which lies at the northwest corner of the marsh. And then by horse cart, they dragged all of this stuff out onto the center of the marsh and dug a large uh, hole where they could float this thing. And this was the day of the inauguration, so to speak, when the first shovel came out of the marsh. And this was seen as uh, progress. They were gonna drain this marsh, take it from a basically useless swamp land and turn it into rich agricultural land through what they called muck farming. The job of the dredge was to dig a ditch eight feet deep, 60 feet wide and 14 miles long, a little longer than the length of the marsh itself because they had to cut through the glacial moraine and around that first bend of the river. It took four years to dig the main ditch and the people who worked on it all but lived on it. They had their own cook and their own bunk because the dredge was way out in the middle of the marsh. You couldn't easily commute each day uh, going from uh, home all the way out in the middle of the marsh, get out there for the day of work and then go back home again. So these people lived on it for probably the whole week and went home for the weekend. So here we see the, uh, the dredge and a couple of the little skiffs that were uh, paddled up to it. And we see looking back the, uh, the dredge, at, uh, the, uh, the, the ditch that they dug and on each side are the dredge spoils. So they essentially just gouged out that ditch and just dumped it on the side. And as you come out of the city of Horicon, if you were to, to canoe or motor up it, you'll still see the, uh, the dredge spoils on each side of the main ditch, which today forms the, uh, the main channel of the marsh. There was one point where the dredge even sunk and they resurrected it. They weren't going to be deterred and they kept on working. Eventually they brought a second dredge in and this was to hurry up the job with the lateral ditches. So four years were uh, utilized for the main ditch. So cutting it from north to south, then these two dredges went back and from the center of the marsh, they cut to each side. They cut a series of channels from uh, each side connecting into the main ditch. So essentially the water would drain to these side ditches into the main ditch and then drain out of the marsh, hoping they could dry the whole thing up. It took six years total from 1910 to 1916 to complete the ditches. And here we see from the city of Horicon, looking back north, there's the main ditch reaching 14 miles of the full length of the marsh and the dredge spoils on each side uh, that were dumped there. And here you can actually see the, uh, the marsh 
This is that main ditch running all the way down and connecting with the outlet of the river. And here are those lateral ditches we see from each side. And uh, as I said, the intent was to drain those backwaters. <clears throat> and then with that, hopefully drain the whole marsh. There's an aerial photo of uh, the main ditch. You can see it running at full length. And here's a couple of those lateral ditches. And here's the uh, trees and shrubs growing along the dredge spoils. Well, these were the investors behind the whole deal. And uh, they were starting some demonstration plots as the outermost reaches of the marsh were beginning to dry up and using this as demonstrations, try to sell people on this. So this was the uh, large tractors they brought in with these uh, massive steel tires so they wouldn't get stuck in that soft muck. And they started breaking the ground. Now they bought the land from the railroad commission at an average price of about 15 to $20 an acre. They sold it to the locals at a price of up to $200 an acre. Doesn't sound maybe like a lot today, but if you go back in the early 1900s, you gotta keep in mind, you could bought a brand new car, your Model T for about $500. This was steep price. These people were putting their life savings into it, but there was a sales pitch. And essentially the sales pitch went something like this, that, hey, we know this is an awful lot of money, but you go out, you borrow from your neighbors and relatives, you borrow from the bank, you mortgage your house, you put your money into this thing. New weight, work this land good and hard, and you will find you're going to pay that off in no time, and then you will make your money on top of it. In fact, the local sales pitch was not just something that they went around and boasted about. They actually had a publication called Onions and in Independence, and they were selling people on farming onions as well as other root crops, the potatoes, carrots, and others in this muck soil. And the uh, sales pitch behind Onions and Independence was, well, sure, you buy this land at a high price, but you work it good and hard, and uh, you will soon be independently wealthy. Well, the only ones who got to be independently wealthy were, of course, the investors behind this whole deal. So here they are plowing those first uh, furrows of the marsh. And you can see this is the cattail and uh, other sedges and grasses that were being plowed under. And here's that rich black soil. The problem is it's not a mineral soil, it's peat. It's a semi-decomposed plant material that had been building up in the bottom of the marsh for over 10,000 years. And it can be fairly rich at first, but it quickly oxidizes, loses its uh, nutrients and certainly the crops draw that out of it quickly and there was no artificial fertilizer available at the time so they found the land lost its fertility quite quickly after a few years the other problem was in spite of all the ditches that they dug and the drainage efforts they finished the uh, uh, ditches in 1916 and in the years 1917 1918 were flood years and so they weren't able to uh, plant their crops and the problem is in of course the upper midwest you got to get your crops in the ground by at least earlier mid-June at the latest for our short growing season so that you can have a decent harvest. Well, if you've got wet soil and it doesn't dry out until midsummer, it's too late to plant. Or in some other years, they were able to plant early enough in spring, but then they had a wet fall, which meant the saturated soil was so mucky they couldn't get out to harvest those crops. In some cases, uh, the onions even took up the taste of the peat soil and weren't marketable. And essentially, it was a whole series of uh, natural disasters between uh, rainy wet seasons with the uh, loss of fertility with uh, poor crop uh, production that led to failure and uh, by the early 1920s a lot of the farmers or farmers already had began, begun to abandon their efforts and so this was really quite short-lived here's an interesting picture it says and this was written on the original picture when i copied this it said plowing peatlands for suckers so as I said, there was no uh, uh, artificial fertilizers that were available. So they said that they actually went down to the Rock River and netted carp and suckers and threw them on the land as a fertilizer. Kind of like the old uh, 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 Indian trick where they would basically dig a hole, put a fish in and a couple of kernels of corn, which would be the natural fertilizer for the, uh, the corn plant. They did this on a larger scale. Now, of course, uh, the other interpretation could be plowing uh, uh, peatlands for suckers uh, I guess we could look back that the suckers may have also been the people who put their life savings into this, lost it all, and got nothing out of it. Either way, I suppose today that both of those might be uh, accurate interpretations. But now the worst was to come, because what you had done was to drain the marsh, till this soil, expose it to the atmosphere, work it for a few years, and then walk away from it. And when the dry summers came, this organic soil began to decompose very rapidly. 
And with the high moisture content in the deeper layers of it, it began not only to decompose and to rot, but uh, with that, the uh, 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 soil is eventually through spontaneous combustion, it caught on fire, just like uh, wet hay. Oh, here, oh, I'm sorry, I, here's a picture of the uh, 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 carp and sucker harvest off the ice in wintertime during the winter kills. So here they were plowing those uh, soils and uh, as I say, eventually abandoning that effort. What happened was the peat fires started then in the early 1920s. Uh, so through spontaneous combustion, all of a sudden that peat soil just lit up and it was like a pile of tires. It wasn't just a, a flames like a forest or grass fire. It was more of that smoldering and they would even burn through the winter time because the upper peat soil insulated the soil uh, from any snow and moisture and uh, essentially it just kept smoldering and burning. Uh, so through a period of 12 years from 1920 to 1932, we had a series of fires that burned across Horicon Marsh. The biggest one burned for three years straight. So what the people saw as a wasteland they wanted to improve was nothing in comparison when they got done with it. Horicon Marsh was not only ditch drain plowed up, but then on fire, and we see right here, one of the only uh, pictures I was ever able to find of the aftermath of the peat fires, is essentially 10,000 years of peat accumulation burned right down to the mineral soil in many places. The marsh was dead and gone, and it wasn't just the duck population, but an entire ecosystem had been lost. Well, it was at that time that the conservation movement was getting a momentum in North America, and there were a lot of conservation causes. Certainly the Save the Everglades, Save the, uh, the Bison, the Egrets, and a variety of other different uh, 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 grassroots causes. And uh, it was also started then in 1921 under the leadership of the person we see here, Lewis uh, Radke. They called him Curly Radke. He worked in the city of Horicon as a foreman and was actually given time off to work on this uh, campaign. And he was a statewide president of the Isaac Walton League, one of our early conservation groups. And their campaign was that they wanted to not just save, but to restore the Horicon Marsh. And so they led these parades through town and uh, lobbied the uh, local and also statewide legislators for this cause that under the guise of conservation, basically they said, look, we tried everything with the marsh. We tried to dam it and flood it. We overhunted it and didn't realize its limitations. We ditched it, drained it, destroyed it. There are no other good uses. And with the continued loss of wetlands and loss of wildlife, this was the best use for this land was they give it back to wildlife and re recreate a wetland. They knew they couldn't do it themselves. So they became a political lobby group. And Curly Radke and uh, his partners from the Isaac Walton League worked with our state legislature from 1921 through 1927 to convince them of the value of this as a statewide conservation effort. And here we actually see them organizing a tour. And this was the Wisconsin state legislature that showed up for a, a boat tour of the marsh. And they were so impressed with the potential of this that in 1927, Wisconsin passed the Horicon Marsh Wildlife Refuge Bill, which was the first time that our state used public money to buy land for wildlife purposes. This was our very first state wildlife area in Wisconsin and one of the early ones in the upper Midwest. So Horicon Marsh began then with this uh, uh, wildlife bill. And what it did, it provided two things. One was the construction of the dam to plug up the ditch and reflood the marsh, and also 10 years of funding to purchase the land. And so they began to buy the land up from the willing sellers, which was easy to find there. The farmers were more than happy to get anything for that land. And uh, with that, they began to buy the land over that 10 year period. Here we see the dedication of the Isaac Walton League. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, this is also uh, a ceremony that was held in 1955 with the passing of Curly Radke. And they erected this monument in his memory as one of the great Wisconsin uh, conservation leaders. And this memorial still stands there today, dedicated in August of 1955. And it says right on here to Lewis Curly Radke, uh, for a lifetime devoted to Wisconsin conservation and the restoration of Horicon Marsh and uh, essentially uh, recognizing and thanking him for that conservation effort. So this marsh is back because of people like this who uh, saw the value and led that, uh, that uh, public uh, campaign to uh, bring back the marsh. Now the state money was only made available for 10 years. So they closed the dam, flooded the marsh, it put out the fires and that set the stage for the plants to grow. And 
you know, it was one of those things you just add water. The marsh came back quite quickly. And with that shallow water and the plant life coming back quickly, it created the wildlife habitat that lured the animals to it. So it showed very quick promise. The problem was that after 10 years, the state of Wisconsin had only purchased one third of the marsh and the money had run out. It would, of course, probably taken uh, several more legislative cycles and much more funding and, you know, probably 20, 30 years or more to try to buy the rest of it. But in the meantime, this had showed such a quick recovery and such a potential for conservation, it was recognized nationwide as an important conservation effort. So the state had acquired then 10,000, uh, that's today a little over 11,000 acres as a state wildlife area. And uh, essentially the federal government came in to purchase the rest of it and they incorporated into the National Wildlife Record System. So the federal government had two choices. One was appropriate federal money to the state. And I guess the thinking was, well, if we're gonna use federal money for wildlife purposes, we have a Fish and Wildlife Service and National Wildlife Refuge System, it'll be part of that. And this is why today Horicon Marsh is divided into two separate administrative units. The Southern one third or about 11,000 acres is a state wildlife area. The Northern two thirds, almost 22,000 acres is a national wildlife refuge. The marsh also has other recognitions. It is a unit of the Ice Age National Scientific Reserve of Wisconsin. Our last ice age is known as the Wisconsin Ice Age. We've got some outstanding landscape features related to that ice age. They're scattered across the state and nine separate units of that are part of the Ice Age Reserve System. Horicon Marsh is, uh, is obviously set aside as a wonderful example of an extinct glacial lake. <coughs> Horicon Marsh is also one of our very first important bird areas. When that program started in Wisconsin, I provided the uh, uh, data and uh, information for this to essentially help with the criteria to establish uh, that for the rest of our Wisconsin wildlife air, uh, uh, important bird areas. And so we became basically the uh, test or pilot program for the uh, statewide effort for important bird areas program. And it turned out was, uh, Horicon Marsh ranked as the uh, highest most category, not only as a uh, statewide, regional, or nationally important, but a globally important bird area. It is essentially a link of migrant birds coming all the way from South America on their way to Canada up in the Arctic. So uh, it, uh, it's uh, certainly a very high ranking, important bird area. Other dedications and recognition for the marsh is it is a wetland of international importance under what's called the Ramsar Convention of the United Nations. That was established in 1977. Each member nation of the UN has uh, recognized at least one wetland within their country that is internationally important. And uh, we were number 11 on that program. We're now up uh, over 35, almost 40 uh, wetlands of international importance, but it ranks among some of the early ones with, uh, these are some of the first established uh, wetlands of international importance, obviously Everglades, Okefenokee Swamp, Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Bay, and our Horicon Marsh. So Horicon Marsh today hosts uh, over a half a million people a year uh, as visitation coming for uh, wildlife related recreation. I will have to say that those are very fuzzy numbers because we don't have a single gate where they come through like say a national park does. So people visit from all kinds of sides and uh, driving through. So these are a little bit soft numbers, but we've had both uh, the state, the Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Tourism, and even university studies trying to quantify the visitation. We figure there's at least a half a million people a year who come to enjoy the marsh. And from that, there's also, they've tried to extrapolate an economic impact uh, and importance of the marsh. So not only it's uh, human and recreational importance and it's ecological importance, it also has an estimated economic uh, impact of five to seven million dollars a year. So however you measure it, Horicon Marsh today is very important to an awful lot of people. Now, we also know that Horicon Marsh has become a big site for Canada geese. As I said, 100 years ago, it was known as a duck marsh. The geese came later on. This is with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service trying to lure wildlife back to the marsh. Believe it or not, as much as we see Canada geese today, by the 1940s, Canada geese were extremely rare. And had we had the... Um, Endangered Species Act back at that time, it probably would have qualified. Canada geese were in serious trouble in the 1940s and 50s. The giant Canada goose, the one that's taken over all of our parks and golf courses, was already believed to be extinct by that time. 
Well, they started luring the geese back to Horicon Marsh by planting crops right off of the state highway that crosses the marsh. And here you can see the pictures from the uh, vintage cars back in the, uh, the 60s and through the early 70s. This became a huge spectacle for people. And it became such a big deal that the uh, state patrol and sheriff had to come through to keep the traffic moving because on Sunday afternoons, they said the traffic was so heavy, people trying to view the geese that they would block up the traffic. So the farmers and locals took three to five hours to get across only a couple mile stretch of the north end of the marsh. This is what they came to see. And this is one of the famous pictures by local photographer Edgar Miller. Uh, showing that abundance of Canada geese where Horicon Marsh got its new identity as a Canada goose marsh. Well, Canada geese are certainly still important and well-renowned for Horicon Marsh, but today we see it as a uh, wetland ecosystem important to all its component wildlife and with a total bird list of over 300 species. When I worked at Horicon Marsh, I provided the education programs not only for the schools for the tours, weekend visitors, and uh, other organizations and groups. But I had the profound pleasure of being able to provide professional training for scientists from all over the world. 60 some delegations of scientists from 43 foreign countries came to the marsh for professional training. I worked with these people from Southeast Asia. They were so impressed by what they saw of Horicon Marsh and the story we had here. They uh, declared the Tram Chin uh, wildlife area in the Mekong Delta as their first uh, wetland reserve project. And that was inspired from this visit. Here were uh, also scientists from uh, Central Asia who came to learn about the marsh to uh, enhance some of their wetland uh, conservation projects in their countries. My colleagues and friends from Russia from the Lake Baikal area came to visit on a nice chilly winter, make them feel right at home. And uh, the last group, this was actually again from uh, Cambodia and Vietnam. And uh, this fellow was the son of the person who established Tram Chin. Uh, they came again. So it kind of came full circle for myself. So uh, we were really a hub for not only the work that we began here pioneering wetland conservation, but then to share that history and success with scientists from all over the world to help them to further that kind of a cause. So Horicon Marsh certainly is a, a well-known and well-restored area, but it doesn't mean it's without its problems. And I'll wrap up here a little bit about what we understand of the ecology of the marsh. Here's an aerial picture of wintertime. Here we see the marsh itself and the main ditch. The city of Horicon lies here and around it is mostly farmland, some of the richest farmland in Wisconsin. And uh, also the land there that is going to small housing developments and all of this is uh, sources of non-point source pollution, whether it's residential areas or whether this is off of agricultural land. The marsh, as I said, is uh, 30 some thousand acres in size, about almost 33,000 or roughly 50 square miles. The watershed is 500 square miles, so 10 times the area around the marsh drains into it. And essentially whatever we're doing on that land, unless we can keep it on the land, is going downhill downstream and ends up in the marsh. And so it's the catch, catch basin for any of that runoff. Uh, dairy farming has always been big in Wisconsin, America's dairy land and a little bit of an older photo, people who are using the uh, us local streams as a watering hole. Uh, we still see a little bit of this, most of it has been fenced out it is not so much legislated, but considered to be an unfavorable practice. But I took this picture back in the uh, uh, late 80s. It was still going on at that time. And you see what, what happens is it's the trampling of the shoreline, the grazing of that vegetation, the shoreline buffer, and of course, the, uh, the manure and waste that leads to soil and um, uh, nutrient erosion from the uplands into the rivers. Of course, uh, dairy farming is uh, gone. Uh, from small farmly, family farms to larger operations these days and a lot of cash crop. And a lot of that is hundreds of acres in a single monoculture of corn or soybeans in large part. And here we see this is right above the marsh, an area of several hundred acres under the plow. And this is was just in springtime as the uh, <clears throat> uh, land was beginning to uh, thaw a little bit. There's still frost in the ground. And so with that erosion, we're seeing the topsoil in the roadside ditch. And of course, with the next thunderstorm that goes downhill and into the rivers and down to the marsh. As I said, farming is certainly one source, but also around the marsh, we're seeing some of that farmland being converted to rural residential uh, land. 
And it's also fairly well documented that a lot of the nutrient waste, especially from fertilizers and bed waste, is more per acre from people's backyards than it is from farmland even. All of this, whatever we do, is a source of some non-point source pollution. This is what I've christened as the Kikoski foam ball. This is the last dam on the Rock River before it enters the marsh. And it doesn't happen every year, but every so often we'll get these massive foam balls. And I used to get phone calls. People say, so Bill, what's with that? My one answer, one word answer was, well, that's pollution. What it is, it's the phosphates within the, the water, uh, part of the, uh, the nutrient chain. And as it, the, uh, the turbulence as it's going over the dam, as it bubble up, the biggest foam ball I photographed was this one. It was about 30, 40 feet high and over 100 feet across. Well, that makes it visible that we have problems, but the problem is in the water. And here's an aerial view after a thunderstorm. This is the uh, Rock River within the Horicon Marsh itself. And it has the color basically of chocolate milk. This is all the suspended solids within the marsh. Basically all that topsoil that's uh, being lost from different sources, construction sites and agricultural land brought into the marsh. So we've known for a number of years that there were some problems from pollution, uh, particularly that non-point because we don't have big factories there. And so we didn't know uh, to what extent. So we set up a series of monitoring stations. We ran it 1997 to 2000. And then about 10 years later, we did a follow-up to see if some of the best management practices reduced it into what degree. But first we wanted to quantify how bad was it. So these were automatic gauging stations where the west branch of the Rock River comes in, right where you saw that Kikoski foam ball, where the east branch enters the marsh, and then at the outlet of the marsh. And these gauging stations, if you were to look at them, they look like a porta potty with a big hose coming out of it. And the hose was basically a whole variety of monitoring equipment looking at stream flow, temperature, dissolved oxygen, suspended solids, nutrients, phosphorus, uh, phosphates, and uh, nitrogen. And so these were automatically calculated every so often, and especially after rain events. What we found was, of course, uh, this is suspended solids, and that being the nutrients. The big surge was in the spring thaw. When there's no crops on the land, there's no vegetation, and you get that big surge with the frost is still in the ground and everything starts to run off from snow melt and spring rain, that's when the biggest dump comes in is at that time. <clears throat> and we see the same thing here for the, uh, the phosphorus. What we found was that, <coughs> excuse me, over a three year period, about 120,000 pounds of, oh, excuse me, uh, 23,000 uh, pounds of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's 170, uh, 140 to 170,000 pounds of phosphorus were coming in and about 23 million pounds of topsoil a year were dumping into the marsh. In other words, there was enough topsoil coming into the Horicon Marsh in a single year to fill an entire football field six inches deep. And so we have two things happening to the marsh. Sediment is literally filling the marsh in and it's changing it from that peat bottom to a muck bottom. And then the phosphorus is coming in uh, basically supercharging of nutrients. And here's the result. In springtime, when the phosphorus comes in, the plants are still be, just beginning to grow because the water is still so cold. And so if the cattails and other plants can't take it up quick enough, it leads to algae blooms. And here's what we're seeing is in that uh, late spring, early summer, algae begins to form. And if we get enough of a blanket of algae, it creates a cloud effect so that now the sunlight can't reach the bottom of the marsh and the submergent vegetation doesn't grow and take up the nutrients. So you have a feedback, more and more algae, which is not important for wildlife shelter or food. So you get this blanket effect of the algae because of the high phosphorus within it. Now, Horicon Marsh used to be known for some spectacular game fishing. And here you can see a four hour catch of the Rock River right at Horicon. These are all Northern Pike and some big bass and some large pike. Nowadays, they just never get to that size basically because every so often we get these algae blooms and then the die off of the algae, which leads to oxygen depletion. And that means the biggest fish are the first ones to die because they suffocate. So the plants are no longer producing oxygen and the decomposition is so rapid, they use oxygen as a bacteria is rotting all that uh, algae. And with that, as you get oxygen uh, levels that drop quickly, first you lose the big game fish, then the smaller game fish, the pan fish and what's left to live, carp and bullheads who can live in very oxygen depleted waters. And that's just exactly what happened. The marsh has exploded in carp. And the reason for the carp is, well, they've been in there for over 150 years that they were planted as a food fish with the early settlers. 
they've always were somewhat balanced within the marsh, but what happens is they're very prolific, but the, uh, the eggs and the fry are also very susceptible to predation. They're a big food source for the panfish and game fish. But when you've killed them and choked them all out from oxygen depletion, the carp are the only thing left to, to live in there, and you get this population explosion. And these are some of the big carp die-offs that we've had. And we've even tried some local uh, carp treatments to try to knock down the population in some of these areas where they've just completely do dominated the marsh and their wallowing activity has uprooted the submerged vegetation, meaning that there's uh, uh, really no uh, native plant material in the bottom of the marsh. Also, we take a look at muskrat numbers. This is the muskrat harvests records uh, for the marsh. 1975 was one of the peaks. This was uh, just for the state and 35,000 muskrats were taken in 1975 on the federal property, uh, the refuge, they took 90,000 muskrats that same year. 125,000 muskrats were taken. I've shown this to even the sportsmen and trappers and he said, well, Bill is obviously allowed us such liberal seasons, we just trapped them all out and that's why they disappeared. Wrong. In fact, uh, Harold Mathiak, who was one of our early muskrat researchers in the marsh, demonstrated that you can remove 75 to 80 percent of the muskrats off of the marsh like Horicon every year without putting a dent in it. The reason for that is that muskrats will produce four to eight young per litter and two to four litters of young a year. They breed like rats. Well, the muskrats create these openings within the marsh. Without the muskrat, however, you see what happens is uh, this, this it starts to close in. And so there's this tendency of the cattail to dominate. But the muskrats are the ones that keep it open. So like the beavers cutting down the tree, they're using that soft stem material to create their, uh, their huts and also for food. And here we see a nice little muskrat hut. And so there's a nice balance that we wanna maintain and uh, essentially we want the muskrat there because without them, the marsh would tend to close in because of the shallow water. The cattail can grow just about anywhere. We would lose that open water component. So in building a hut like this, you can see around it, the muskrat has shaved everything off. Great job. Plus these little islands are commonly used as nesting platforms for our terns, for geese, and a variety of other birds. <coughs> this is what we call the hemi marsh condition. This is the nice balance between muskrats and vegetation. In other words, what you've got is a 50-50 mixture of water and cattail. And what I mean is not one big pool of water and then uh, a solid cattail around it, but this interspersion, which is not only a nice effect from a, a balanced muskrat population, but also is ideal wildlife uh, habitat. Well, here's what I talked about for the muskrats. This is from Harold Mathiak's uh, study. That's a three-day-old muskrat. Right there is one month. By the time they get to be barely that old, mom kicks them out and starts the next litter. And as I said earlier, four to eight young per litter, two to four litters a year. And if there's no controls, the muskrat population will go through a boom bust cycle. And here's when we get that boom cycle, what we call a muskrat eat out. The population has now gotten so abundant, they've stripped all the cattail off the marsh and that's not good either. So we don't want to have a lack of muskrats. We don't want to have an overabundance. And that's why the trapping comes in is to hold a lid on it and ameliorate that. And so muskrat trappers actually play an important role by holding down these peaks to give us the wildlife habitat. It's all part of the management. And this is the result. You get that nice uh, small pools within the marsh. And these are the areas where the waterfall and other birds congregate. And of course, the Horicon Marsh was originally established as a waterfall area. And so the blue winged teal, mallard, redhead duck, which is uh, important at uh, especially the federal refuge, it's the largest nesting area for redheads in the eastern US. And of course, our wood duck are all part of the waterfall component. Also, what we find here's the uh, gallinule, the coots, uh, they will take advantage of the vegetation. That's all good food for them. The geese, well, they feed more in the uplands, but they're uh, quite abundant within the marsh. And more recently, pelicans have moved in and they're feeding on fish. And what we find is they eat an awful lot of small carp. But again, just like muskrats, carp are so prolific that even these uh, pelicans cannot hold them down. They just are skimming off that surplus, so to speak. The carp still dominate the marsh. And then we get some of the specialties within the marsh. The Sora rail that lives within the, uh, that right at that fringe where the uh, cattail and water meet. Forster's turn, a state endangered species. We've got a very large population nesting at the marsh. And uh, with that, we've seen some of the early changes within populations. And one of the 
um, kind of general misunderstandings that people have is that there seems to be this assumption that, well, you know, if we end up destroying the environment, everything's just going to disappear. The fact is that what really happens is as we alter environments, there are winners and losers. We don't end up wiping it out for everyone. What happens is the specialists are the ones that end up really having the hard time. And it's the generalists that's oftentimes find new opportunities. Why do you think we have so many Canada geese in our parks, city parks and golf courses and industrial parks? It's no longer suitable for much other wildlife, but they love it to the point of even being a nuisance. So what we're seeing is there's some groups of things that are actually increasing. We've got more cattail on the marsh than we ever had. And uh, we also have plenty of algae, but we have a lot of algae, but we don't have the submergent vegetation. It's being shaded out by the algae. And also what's happening is <clears throat> The carp uproot that vegetation, this emergent vegetation, the plants that are growing underwater. Cattails are more abundant. A hundred years ago, wild rice was more common. Purple loose strife has come into the marsh. We've been able to use the uh, Galaricella beetles for uh, biocontrol, so it's no longer much of a, a problem or concern. But bulrush is another plant that's not that common. Carp and bullhead are the dominance today. A hundred years ago, it was pike and panfish. Canada geese are certainly abundant. Ducks are not. Pelicans and uh, gulls have moved in, and we're seeing some of these others, the, the rails, the terns, the bitterns, uh, they're starting to show some declines. Whoa, I'm sorry about the uh, sound effects that worked in there. So really what we're seeing is it's not just simply that uh, the sediment nutrients are uh, leading to the uh, changes and declines within the marsh. Pardon me on that one. Uh, but what we're seeing is that changes in the land use practices around the marsh have resulted in this hyper sedimentation and nutrient input within the marsh. And so uh, what we find is that the bottom of the marsh is turning more to muck and we're getting so much phosphorus coming in, that's leading to the uh, changes. So the substrate, the bottom of the marsh is going from peat to muck. The carp love it, they wallow around in there also makes it more difficult for the spawning for uh, uh, things like our panfish and our pike. The phosphorus leads to algae blooms. So as I stated earlier, all that runoff leads that early growth of algae. The algae shades out other plants and then decomposes. That leads to oxygen depletion. Oxygen levels go down, which then kill off the predator fish, the panfish and the uh, pike, and allowing the carp to dominate. The carp are wallowing now in uh, uh, extraordinary numbers, uprooting the vegetation and resuspending those nutrients and sediments by wallowing around, keeping it out there in the ecosystem and rather than letting it uh, uh, settle out. And that leads to loss of the food for our waterfowl and other marsh wildlife. The sediment also gets moved around by the wind and carp and lodges within the cattails, which means now that the, with the sediment in these cattail stands, what used to be a hemi marsh allows for more and more cattail. It becomes so dense that the muskrats can't even get in there to build their huts. As the muskrat numbers go down, we lose that hemi marsh condition. We end up with solid stands of cattail and then these open pools of water that have been basically stripped by the carp. And so these changes in that habitat composition and structure lead to the loss of opportunities for the wetland specialists and sometimes increases in generalists. Now, this is worst case scenario of where the marsh could be headed if we don't do something to slow down this hyper sedimentation and nutrient inputs. It is still an area that's extremely rich and very diverse. It is a marsh we're lucky to have saved once. If we lose it again, it's not going to be so overt, such as a ditching and draining effort. Instead, it'll be a long-term attrition of the marsh. As slowly things start to become more and more dominated by cattail and carp and losing opportunities for some of the other birds, we'll lose a few of the specialists and opportunities for them. Right now, we still have that time. We're starting to see the early warning signs of the marsh. It is not sustainable, like so many of the things that we're doing with natural resources. We know the causes and we know that we need to change our habits. In other words, it's not just people living around the marsh telling the government, hey, you got to do something with the marsh. No, it's the people who live there who need to do something to find a more sustainable lifestyle to protect the marsh itself because it's downhill from where they live. So the last thing I was able to do while working at the marsh was develop the education center uh, where we were able to use these kinds of uh, uh, lessons to share with the public, to enlighten them with the marsh, the assets, and also its vulnerabilities. <laughs>
So with that, I'll uh, kind of wrap up there. Uh, Horicon Marsh is one of our great natural resources, but it's gone through a, kind of a brutal history and it is back again today. We are seeing some early warnings of some perturbations from human impacts. But uh, as I say, at this point, it's alive and well and extremely rich. We just wanna make sure we keep it that way. So thank you so much for your time. I'm glad to be able to do this presentation for you. And I'll certainly be glad to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bill. That's uh, excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, we could go. Let's see if anybody's put any questions into the chat mode. Um, I don't see any particular. Um, maybe I've got some questions. Okay. Evan's got some here. Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to take my canoe up and paddle around. Are you allowed to paddle everywhere? Do you have to get a permit? What's the canoe situation? Excellent question. You can paddle anywhere within the state wildlife area. The duck hunters do it, and certainly anybody else can. Um, because of that, I would certainly avoid, say, opening duck weekend, but uh, you've got most of the year to, to paddle around it, and spring is a spectacular time. You cannot paddle in the National Wildlife Refuge. Keep that in mind. But I'll give you the best route. You put in at the Greenhead Landing, which is where the Greenhead uh, Hunting Club is. That's where the East Branch of the Rock River enters the marsh. And you can paddle out right down the river. It's a slow enough current. You can turn around and come right back upstream. Or if you want, you can paddle all the way through to the city of Oricon. And uh, they used to be able to provide a shuttle for you. Or you can arrange something for yourself. But uh, that's a wonderful way to explore it. And you'll get a whole different feel like any of these types of systems by being out in the middle of it and really feel the vastness compared to just say standing on a hill and glancing over it. Yeah, the best way to experience it, definitely. Cool, and so uh, what are the prospects for a phosphorus ban on the uh, properties uh, upstream? Uh, we've actually been working with, uh, well, there was one dairy that uh, had a point source pollution problem. We worked with them, we reduced that by over 90%. And we're working with the uh, agricultural community trying to find more sustainable ways of uh, 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 farming. Um, I talked to some of the people who are in our office who worked in that field. And I said, well, now with changes uh, going more to these corporate farms, uh, are we seeing an increase in uh, nutrient problems? And their take was, they said, actually, it's a little easier because these people are oftentimes trained in the agricultural scientists, sciences rather than the, uh, the farmer you know, the family farmer. And instead of having to try to train 50 of them, you've got one large operator. So we may have a little bit better way of reaching these people. And of course, it's also driven by economics, but we're trying to find some ways and incentives that it makes it a little bit more sustainable. Obviously, it's also better for them in the long run to keep that fertilizer and topsoil on their land rather than letting it go down in the marsh, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you're talking about farming, and that's probably the predominant source. But, uh, you know, as I see, uh, you know, uh, uh, houses going up, you know, turf wands are also sources if you don't have a phosphorus right. fertilizer ban. And that's, a, that's, again, a bigger challenge because there you've got the individual homeowner. How do you reach them and message it for them? Um, farming, I guess, is the bigger problem in terms of its acreage. Uh, we can't, of course, when you have a gauging station, you're just measuring what's in the river, you can't separate what's coming from residential areas from what's coming from agricultural land. It's all in the water at one. So we don't know the proportions. Uh, we do have, a, say, a better in with the agricultural community to reach a couple of the larger operators uh, trying to reach each uh, homeowner. That's, of course, a challenge no matter what environmental issue you want to try to, to share with people, right? But well, we passed a fertilizer ban here where I live because we got tired of the algae in the pond. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. You wonderful presentation. Um, well, thank uh, you, Bill. We've got a couple more questions. Uh, two or three. Oh yeah. Um, Let me know. Okay. Um, uh, somebody, uh, <coughs> Stephen, Stephen commented they had seen a couple uh, whooping cranes at Horicon last year, and do you know if they nest there? Yes. I also saw the comment about blue hair on tours taking people out. Unfortunately, that family is trying to sell that business. And I worked with them for many, many years. Uh, I worked originally with the father who started it and then his son who ran it all years uh, throughout his entire career. So blue hair on tours who had canoe rentals and ran the pontoon boat tours, uh, they just shut down within the last year. Um, as far as whooping cranes, you're not only gonna see them on the marsh, it is a release site. 
So uh, Wisconsin has become one of the major areas for the uh, Eastern Crane uh, Population Recovery Program. And Horicon Marsh is being used as a site for what they call direct autumn release. So in other words, we tried over at Nacida Wildlife Refuge to introduce cranes and start a breeding population. The problem we ran into was the height of the nesting season was the height of a black fly hatch. And a lot of these birds were essentially being harassed so much by the, the dense black fly hatch in that part of the state that they would abandon their nest. So then they moved that operation over to White River Marsh, which is to the northwest of Horicon Marsh. So right now there is a hand rearing and release site there uh, for that. But then direct autumn release, what that is, is they're raising them in isolation. And rather than trying to establish a breeding population uh, that way, they're releasing the cranes when they are now uh, near full grown in the fall, having them associate with the sandhill cranes and with other whooping cranes in the area and follow the migration there. So we're basically doing kind of a shortcut thing, raise them and, and put them out there and have them find their way. And so, yeah, we do have now a few nesting pairs of whooping cranes, at least one that's nested uh, the same place the last two years. And we're hoping over time to have more and more whooping cranes that will eventually mature after say four to six years as adult birds and begin nesting out there. Mm, okay, Lisa would like to know if there's any talk of sectioning off a portion of the marsh and doing carp and nutrient control. Okay, nutrient control you have to do at the source. You really can't do much once it's in the marsh. Um, I've had people talk to me about say, can we dredge it and move the soil back up to the farmers? First of all, dredging, this is gonna be, remember it's filling up just by inches. So it'd be this shallow dredging. And the big problem for dredging anywhere is it's not just the machinery to remove it, but it's the trucking. And it's a, a, a couple of dollars a yard. I think it's usually about $3 a yard, an average dump truck, depending on smaller or big ones, they're like 12 to 16 yards. When you're talking $3 a yard, and you want to remove this stuff, we're talking tens and tens of millions of dollars. It's completely impractical, infeasible. Um, for the carp treatment, what we have done is to use a, a rotenone treatment. And if you're not familiar with rotenone, it's a naturally occurring compound from the Barbarossa vine in South America. It was actually the natives in the upper Amazon who used it as a fishing technique. They dig up the root from the Barbarossa vine, pulverize it, put it in the water, it dissolves there, what it does, it doesn't poison the carp. People use it for fishing because they eat them. It essentially collects along the gills of the fish and it uh, interferes with an enzyme that's used in oxygen metabolism. In other words, the hemoglobin that attaches that oxygen molecule is an enzyme reaction. They suffocate, they can't breathe. So it doesn't poison the meat. And it basically breaks down into organic compounds depending on the water temperature, usually about three to five days, so cold water, a little bit more, maybe up to a week. The problem is if you do, and we've tried large scale treatment, we can do it. And we've tried it, I think three times from the 1970s into the nineties. Uh, but it's a real disruption because they are a food source for some wildlife out there anyway, even if they are so abundant. Uh, and so we tried it one time and we thought, well, we could eradicate the carp. One treatment, wipe them all out and that's it, clean slate and start all over. What we found was, well, 10 years later, they're back again because we have not changed the marsh in its condition as ideal carp habitat. So now what we're trying to do is we realize that this eradication of carp is impractical and infeasible. We're trying more suppression and it's what we call spot treatment. And spot treatments as uh, the, uh, a person had referred to, here's what we do. The carp will migrate upstream to spawn just like salmon will. In early spring, when the water temperature is about 55 degrees, carp move upstream. Uh, Northern pike spawn at 39 degrees, by the way. And so the carp will move up, but then they hit the dam at the federal refuge and they can't get over it. So you got this big boil of carp, you drop a big uh, fight net around behind them, you corral them, you drop your rote known in, and you basically spot treat that, that mass of carp right there. It's a suppression program. We also have electrical barriers in two of the rivers coming into the marsh. And again, as they're moving upstream, they're diverted into that and they're, then they're removed. And what we're doing is we're giving them to the farmers. They remove them and throw them out in their fields as fertilizer. Um, it's somewhat successful. It's at least trying to, uh, some effort to suppress the carp population. So that's what's in place right now. Hmm. Before I forget, uh, 
Bill, if when your book comes out, will it be found on your website that's at the bottom of the page here? Yeah, I'll, I'll post it there. Um, we were just, as I said, we were just down at the uh, State Historical Society. We're in the archives looking for some of the last uh, just half a dozen uh, records yet. And uh, we found a couple of really good tidbits. It doesn't change the entire book, but it inserts a couple of neat, neat little uh, items in there. And uh, I think we're all done in the, uh, the collection of material. And we'll be approaching the uh, State Historical Society Press and U University of Wisconsin Press for publication. It'll be sometime later this year. But yeah, there, we'll, we'll have it on my website. We'll announce it and I'll get the word out. But it basically, we refer to it as the Indian Mounds of Horicon Marsh in the Upper Rock River. And we use the term Indian mounds uh, because it's not just effigy mounds, it's the older conical mounds. I know we refer to the culture and the people as Native Americans, but uh, in the archaeology, um, they still are generically referred to as Indian mounds. So we decided that's not entirely uh, politically incorrect, we thought. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I had another, um, if, if, if ideally, um, something could be what you'd want it to be or to be for the future. Um, what modern science might you use to um, increase or uh, the size of this or to make it more perfect as to today's science compared to when this started, this project started? Well, I think probably the, the best thing you could do is if you could try to do uh, streamside buffers, all the creeks and rivers coming into the marsh to have some sort of vegetative buffer to capture, trap, and slow down that uh, sediment and nutrient input. Um, so that's probably the best. It's, it's not going to be a government program to buy all of that. That's not going to sell real well uh, among the farmers, I'm sure, but uh, to work with them through the, the agricultural programs and provide some incentives to use some of the different farm bills, such as uh, the uh, Wetland Reserve Act, uh, the uh, CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program, uh, things like that to, to try to implement that. And through the agriculture community, working with uh, Department of Natural Resources and the Fish and Wildlife Service to try to use those as incentives and programs for addressing the uh, sediment nutrient runoff. I see a question here about are this, uh, still the heron rookeries in the marsh and are we building platforms? I was part of the project when we built the platforms in the marsh. And uh, what happened was uh, basically it was just the su success of the herons themselves. They'd been on that one island, Four Mile Island for 50 years. There were over a thousand nesting pairs at its peak in the uh, 70s, early 80s. 82 was the big peak record. And then it started to decline. And what happened was, and I realized this, uh, herons was one of my early study. I, I actually did uh, surveys and studies of heron rookeries all across southern Wisconsin and the Mississippi River. And what we found was basically there's a lifespan to a rookery. The birds find an isolated area. They're very successful. They lure other birds in. They take advantage of it. And what happened at Four Mile Island, their own success, if you can imagine a thousand nesting pair. So in other words, you got 2,000 adults with one to three young on there year after year, that's a lot of guano. And so they're bringing those fish in and that nutrient rich guano is now basically over fertilizing the island. It was starting to stress the trees. They were basically pooping out their own trees over long-term period. They were becoming stressed from, uh, from all the guano. And so as the trees were starting to die, the birds were, were leaving. And that's why we tried the artificial uh, uh, mm. nest platforms with telephone poles turned out that we put the platforms up and the birds were already moving to another island on their own. Ah, so nice. what I suggested was this. I said, you know, what we need to do is let's take a, a, a long-term look. I'm talking 50 to 100 years. Let's make sure we have sufficient isolated islands with mature trees out there so that when they do abandon one colony, there's an alternative site available to keep them there over time. Because we know, that, as I said, there's a lifespan. These colonies don't last forever, but you need to have sites where they can move around over time. And we know why the birds abandon these sites. Uh, the, the real trick is what gets them to agree on a new site? That's a tough one. They need to all kind of find this as a colonial nester. And so, uh, yeah, they are still nesting out there, not in that high concentration on a single island like they were back in the, the 1980s. But uh, great blue herons and egrets are still part of it. 
The other thing that we see is there's a big nesting colony up by Lake Winnebago uh, for egrets. And so the uh, uh, egrets are not in huge numbers on Horicon Marsh through the spring and early summer. But as soon as you get to early mid-July, now those birds that have fledged uh, from that colony come down to fatten up at Horicon. Because uh, from, again, studies that uh, myself and colleagues did on herons and egrets, we found that from a colony, they fly about 12 to 15 miles. Some of them will fly up to 20 miles for food. But there's a little bit of that diminishing return. How long does it take for an adult to fly from the nest, way out, hang out, try its fish lucking, uh, uh, luck fishing, get some food, come all the way back and feed the young before they starve to death? So there's all kind of a radius. In other words, Oshkosh area, that Winnebago colony is too far from Horicon to use it during the nesting season as a feeding ground. But as soon as those young have fledged, they spread out now looking for food and they come down to the market.